Make America great again. That is a very widespread slogan these days in the campaign of Donald Trump, and it seems to be attracting a lot of interest and a lot of support. People want to make America great again, and Mr. Trump is one who promises that he's got what it takes to do it because he's done so many other great things and now he's ready to make America great again. Well, it would be a wonderful thing to make America great again. And in order for that to occur, we might want to ask in the first place, what makes a nation great? What makes a nation great? Because in order to make it great, you better know very well what makes a nation great, or you might be shooting for the wrong things. Well, if you were asked, what is, what is it that makes a nation great? There are a number of things that people might mention. One would be good education. A nation filled with ignoramuses who know very little, are not wise, are not well informed, is probably not going to be a great nation, but a nation where people are very knowledgeable and have a, a solid approach to education and learning is going to be greater than a nation that doesn't. Others might say, well, what really makes a nation great is power, a strong military, outstanding troops, army, navy, air force, marines, well-funded, superbly equipped and trained, able to beat anybody else in the world, and maybe add to that, um, good police forces, strong law and order, and maybe even add to that, citizens armed to the teeth. We love our Second Amendment. We want guns, guns, more guns, maybe even some assault weapons. And so, if we as a nation have the biggest, baddest military machine on the planet and the toughest cops and citizens with a gun in every drawer and vehicle, we will be a great nation. Well, it might be good to have a well-equipped military, but Hitler had a well-equipped military. The Soviet Union had a well-equipped military. Is that what you call a great nation? Those who can blow others up and invade them when they would like to? Another thing that some think of as making a nation great is a thriving economy. And many citizens tend to vote on the economy. If they think their pocketbook has been pinched the last few years, they'll vote against whoever's been running the show because they believe that it's the economy, stupid, as one presidential campaign had it. Uh, the economy is what matters. And no doubt uh, you want to have a nation that's flourishing and where things are going well economically. But once again, to be rich... And to have lots of stuff, is that alone enough to make a nation great? We might emphasize ideals, freedom, the land of the free, liberty, equality of opportunity, where anybody, no matter what their beginnings or background, can succeed. And so you have freedoms to to make your own choices and not be pushed around and constrained by others. You have opportunities and equal opportunities, and these things would make a nation great. But, but again, though those things are excellent in their own setting, just having the opportunity to do whatever you feel like and have everybody equal, once again, what does equal mean? You know, for some people, equality means socialism. And someone has said, you know, um, capitalism is prosperity unequally divided, and socialism is... Misery equally divided. So sometimes you, you have to be careful what you're looking for when you aim for equality because that kind of equality has brought more than one nation down into the dust. Again, freedom and equality are great ideals and yet just taken kind of in the air uh, apart from other things can make people more miserable rather than less miserable. Leaders, effective leaders, Certainly, presidential campaigns will say, this nation will be great again if you elect me. Well, there's no doubt that great leadership is important in the greatness of a nation, and there's no doubt that many of the pretenders who claim to be great aren't. 
So when we ask what makes a nation great, we can say, well, learning and education, uh, military ability, a thriving economy, freedom, equality, and good ideals, effective leaders, those things may all be pieces in a larger puzzle, but they are not what makes a nation great. You might say, well, that's your opinion. No, it's not my opinion. I'll give you something beyond opinion. Here is what makes a nation great. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness makes a nation great. And a nation that lives in unrighteousness is not a great nation. And unless it grows in righteousness, it will not grow in greatness. This is not my opinion. This is what God says. Righteousness exalts a nation. If I can backtrack again to the one who wants to make America great, um, he says that I am a great Christian. And he in some ways typifies a bit of what Christianity has become in our country, boasting about what a great Christian one is, while by his own admission hardly ever attending church. He's bragged about adultery with many of the top women in the world, as he calls them, he divorced two wives, calls women fat pigs, dogs, and bimbos. He owns casinos and strip clubs in Atlantic City and in Las Vegas, where it's pretty hard to run strip clubs and casinos without working with some pretty seedy characters. Well, you are a seedy character if you're running that kind of stuff, okay? You don't even need to talk about the seedy characters he might be associating with. This used to be called organized crime when you ran strip clubs and casinos. Um, repeatedly used bankruptcy to avoid his own financial obligations, even though he was extremely wealthy, uh, funded uh, politicians who supported abortion and gay marriage and said, I'm extremely pro-choice. In his current campaign, he promises to torture our enemies and to murder their children. And he says he never asks God to forgive him because he is such a good Christian. Now, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I will tell you that he's not going to make America great. Okay, he's not going to help it to grow in righteousness. And I don't care if he can get... Uh, what's going on with Ben Carson? The man who says what we need is moral renewal in our nation. And when he dropped out of the presidential race, said he was going to lead a group that's going to work for the moral renewal. And less than a week later, endorses this great Christian. Um, Jerry Falwell, Sr., founded an outfit called The Moral Majority. Jerry Falwell Jr., well, he endorses the, the multiple adulterer, bankruptcy, casino, strip club dude. What makes a nation great? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. It's a disgrace to have someone like that getting the support of so many Christians. I may be insulting some of you here, I don't know, but it's a disgrace, okay? It's a disgrace. Righteousness exalts a nation. Well, how does that occur? Well, let's just go back to some of these things that we talked about earlier that are important for a nation. Good education, a strong military, a thriving economy, freedom and opportunity, effective leaders. All of those really can't survive on their own without being empowered by righteousness. Think about education. In the realm of education in our country, it has become increasingly opposed to the Creator. Government officials and school boards have outlawed mention of a Creator in the classroom. In random evolution, well, that's taught as a fact beyond dispute. Marriage is, well, it's whatever we say it is. And we wind up with our school system worshiping the gods of sex and baby sacrifice and our whole country doing that with 50 million abortions and with the licentious living that our country has fallen into. It, it's like the ancient worshipers of Asherah and Shemosh and Molech and those other gods and goddesses where they were gods of fertility, where right within their temples you would have these orgies and you would have child sacrifice all in the name of being great and wonderful. And that's what our educators are feeding us. 
Christians began the movement to educate everybody, girls as well as boys, poor as well as rich. The foundations of education in the modern world were laid by righteousness and by Christian principles. Christians, during what were sometimes called the Dark Ages, kept learning alive, and they helped renew learning and civilization. Christians took the lead in starting school systems. They started all the world's greatest universities, were started by Christians, and widespread education, even today, might not exist without all the influence of Christianity. So even if you said education is what makes the nation great, you might want to give credit where credit is due and realize that it was actually righteousness and a desire to know the scriptures that gave rise to good education in the first place. Already more than 100 years ago, a Princeton professor, A.A. A. Hodge, was very concerned that government was taking over education because he didn't think it was the role of government to run schools. And he said, I am as sure as I am of Christ's reign that a comprehensive and centralized system of national education separated from religion as is now commonly proposed, will prove the most appalling enginery for the propagation of anti-Christian and atheistic unbelief and of anti-social nihilistic ethics, individual, social, and political, which this sin-rent world has ever seen. Now he talks a little bit like a professor, but the short version is, it's bad. <laughs> okay? You're going to have a mess if you have a state-run, godless education system. And we're seeing the fruit of that. When it comes to the question of the military, we do have a powerful military, okay? If military makes a great nation, we are the greatest. 43% of all military spending in the world is by the United States alone. There's more, what, about 200 countries in the world. We spend about half of the money that gets spent on the military. We spend more on our military than the next 17 countries put together. So if military spending and military firepower make a great nation, we's it. Well, what does the Bible say about that? Some trust in chariots, some in horses, some in missiles, some in bombers, some in nukes. We trust in the name of the Lord our God. <clears throat> no king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength, but the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. Adolf Hitler had a great military, and he said that he was setting up a thousand-year Reich, a thousand-year empire, and it lasted 12. Stalin had massive military power, and yet the Soviet Union and, all, and its client states collapsed with hardly a shot being fired. The United States has had a great military power, but has not always used it so wisely and well. And sometimes our military power has caused us more harm than good. When we went into Vietnam with our superior military, what did we really achieve? When we invaded Iraq, because we could. What did we really achieve? When we brought down Iran's ruler in the 50s by CIA covert operations, did that make Iran our buddy? They've hated us ever since. We installed the Shah, but when they overthrew the Shah, they wound up with an Islamic revolution. We supported Osama bin Laden against the Russians and funded them militarily and gave Osama and his cohorts weapons, how did that work out? Now these are very complicated things. I'm not going to try to oversimplify them. I will simply say this. If you got a bunch of weapons and a bunch of money and just throw them at people in other parts of the world to try to work your will in those parts of the world, it can come back to bite you. And why? Well, if for no other reason, no king is saved by the size of his army. What if we have been trusting too much in our military power and not enough in the need for righteousness and to be a positive force among the nations instead of simply the biggest stick on the block. And then there's prosperity. Uh, if prosperity matters, and, and it does in the well-being of a nation, then you can't have prosperity for too long as a nation 
without some level of righteousness. In the first place, thou shalt not steal. A belief in private property is, is just vital to the development of prosperity in a nation. Belief that work is worthwhile and not just something to toss off to the slaves was very important in the development of prosperity in the world. A belief in stewardship, that what you have is from God and that you're to manage it wisely and well because it comes from Him and you have a calling from Him. These are the things that motivated much of the original prosperity of people in Europe and America. A belief in personal responsibility, that I'm not just going to sponge off others, but if I have the health and the opportunity, I'm going to do my best. Compassion for the poor. On the one hand, socialism isn't necessarily the answer, but on the other hand, to just say, ah, let them, let them starve, it's their problem, they should just work harder. Let the sick and disabled, let them waste away. What happens in countries that do that? They find themselves with revolutions because they have demonstrated no righteous concern for the needy. And so the overall stability and well-being of a country has got to also take into account that of its weakest citizens. Moral capital, not just financial capital. Go to some of these really, really corrupt countries and you'll find the economies can't get anywhere because nobody can trust anything. No contract means anything. And so you just plain can't do business in the first place. Now in every system there's enough sin and corruption to make it difficult, but where the level of righteousness and trust gets too low, you simply cannot conduct economic affairs. So moral capital is even more important and foundational for financial capital. And underneath all of that, strong families. Without the family, there's usually poverty, okay? You, you'll hear a lot of different explanations. And some people, of course, it's in, in some countries, they just don't have opportunity. In our country, you really need to do three things and you will have a very, very low chance of poverty. One is don't get married till you're 20. Get married and stay married and don't have, you know, and then your children will not live in poverty. And, and you stay married, okay? You have almost no chance of being in poverty when you're age 40 if you don't have children as a teen, if you get married, and just stay married. I'm not saying all that to just throw blame on everybody who still struggles or is in poverty, but overall that generalization is true. And so to pretend that family doesn't matter, that righteousness in marriage doesn't matter, is a formula for economic ruin. Righteousness exalts a nation economically. Uh, and, of course, sobriety helps a little bit, too. Uh, when too many people are either getting into drugs or drunkenness, that's another great cause of poverty. On the other hand, when, when people are living in God's way of righteousness, what happens? Psalm 144 says, Then our sons in their youth will be like well-nurtured plants, and our daughters will be like pillars carved to adorn a palace. Our barns will be filled with every kind of provision. Our sheep will increase by thousands, by tens of thousands in our fields. Our oxen will draw heavy loads. There will be no breaching of walls, no going into captivity, no cry of distress in our streets. Blessed is the people of whom this is true. Blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. So you have, you have these, these things that might make a nation great. You think about them and, and you wonder, um, what if, you know, should we brag if we have good education or if we have a strong military or a thriving economy? What does the prophet Jeremiah say? He says, not, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. He delights in righteousness. That's why righteousness exalts a nation. Because God delights in it, and when God smiles on you, that makes you great. And to just brag about wisdom, to just brag about your military power, to just brag about your wealth, those are not the things that give us bragging rights, but instead 
the knowledge of God and His righteousness. What makes a nation great? Well, we've looked at how righteousness is so basic for education, even for the use of military and for a thriving economy. What about freedom and opportunity and about leadership? Well, again, when we think about freedom, voluntary righteousness is the foundation of freedom. If people do not voluntarily, freely choose a path of righteousness, their freedom will not last for long. If you say, oh, I don't care about being righteous, you will soon find yourself addicted to something. We have a nation that just talks and talks and talks about freedom. And nowhere in the world are there more people with addictions. Nowhere in the world are there people with more chemical addictions and pornography addictions and, and the other kinds of addictions that just drive us and enslave us because freedom without righteousness is slavery. And sometimes at a wider level, freedom without righteousness is chaos. People just do whatever they please and a nation falls into disorder. You cannot pretend that freedom will last long unless most people are voluntarily choosing to be righteous. Go to some sections of our major cities where the family has completely degenerated, and it's a very dangerous and unsafe place to be. You can call that freedom if you want. If you feel free in a place where you don't dare to go out on the street, that's not freedom. Now, a few years ago, I remember the Chicago police chief visited China and said we could learn a lot from China about law enforcement. Well, that's encouraging. Uh, you know, I guess that's, but that's what happens when you've been a police chief and seen too much chaos. You think, you know, a, a totalitarian police state's starting to look pretty good to me. But that's what you do get when you get that kind of disorder. When the French Revolution occurred, what came after? A totalitarian state run by the Emperor Napoleon. It was launched in the name of freedom, and they got themselves an emperor. So, if we want to be free, we can't pretend that we can dispense with righteousness. In John chapter 8, Jesus says, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Anyone who sins is a slave to sin. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If you're a freedom lover, don't pretend that righteousness doesn't matter. Jesus says, I am the key to freedom. If the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Because then you'll have the freedom to do what you want because what you want will be the right things. And what you want will be the things that don't get you trapped and addicted and enslaved. Because when the power of the Holy Spirit is in you, and when the Lord Jesus has set you free from your past, you can live in freedom. You can seize the opportunities. Otherwise, all you can do is yak about freedom while you just follow whatever base urges are controlling you. The sun sets you free, you'll be free indeed. And then a final thing that we talk about when it comes to making a nation great is leadership. But what is an effective leader? What kind of leader makes a nation great? Well, what if you were a, a superb general? and a, an absolutely outstanding administrator, and you did some great public works projects, and managed all of that very intelligently, would that make you a great national leader? Well, some would say yes. I'll just take one example from the Bible. There are many, but it's very helpful and informative to read the books of Kings and to see how God assesses leaders. We'll take the example of Amri. Amri was a very good general and skilled. Uh, he came to power by defeating the other military contenders for the throne and wiped out the families of the other contenders and took charge. Amri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all those before him. As for the other events of Amri's reign, what he did and the things he achieved, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? That's how God evaluates things. I was in Israel. I remember being at Megiddo and at other sites there. There's a great underground tunnel, a massive uh, marvel of construction that was built there under Amri and under his son Ahab. There were other great things that Amri did and impressive things that the archaeologists find. For 200 years afterward, the other nations referred to Israel as the house of Amri. 
And what does God say about him? He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He was worse than anybody else. And if you want to read anything else about him, read somewhere else. And he had a kid named Ahab who topped him in wickedness. That's what the Bible had to say about him. There's other kings too. Um, Jeroboam II of Israel. Um, according to the historians and the researchers on this, Israel flourished more than at any other time under his reign. And the Bible speaks of his reign as kind of the point when Israel crossed the point of no return. They seemed to be prospering, and that was when everything was being hollowed out and the nation was being set up for complete collapse. So a, a leader who is just shrewd and a good military manager and knows something about the economy may be wrecking his nation completely. What's the Bible say about leadership worth trusting? Well, it says when the righteous increase, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. It's better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. There are a number, of, I, I have a whole sermon on this, I won't give it here. The title is Never Trust a Politician. And you might nod and say, well, of course not. Who's going to trust one of those sleazeballs? But that's not why. There are some, there are some overall good politicians um, upright people who do the right thing. But even if you could get a good politician, and certainly not all of them are, but some are, even then never trust a politician. Why not? Because he's a son of man in whom there is no salvation. Okay? There's only so much even the best politician can do for you. And if you're counting, if we could elect the finest, smartest person in the United States right now, the most capable leader, he would not save this nation. Okay, there is no salvation for this nation from even the finest political leadership. I pray that we'll get good political leadership, but that won't be enough. We need a people that is transformed, and ultimately we need salvation, which no politician is going to bring us. So that's why you should never trust a politician. One of the problems of our nation is every time something goes wrong, we think it's either the politician's fault and we believe the next one who comes along who says he can fix it. The one will promise hope and change. The next one will say, let's make America great again. They've been saying that for a long time. Everyone says that he's going to be better than the last guy. It's not true. Even if they were good, they don't have the power to remake this nation and make it righteous again. What we need more than anything else is a transformation in the nation, but even more than that, a transformation in a different kind of nation. One of the difficulties that we face is idolizing politicians and expecting too much from them. Another is idolizing our own country. Our own country in some ways is typified by the Donald Trump attitude. We're the best just because we're us. Okay. Donald is the best because he's Donald. He inherited a lot of money, millions, you know, thousands and thousands of properties in New York he was born with. The poor guy says he scraped by on a loan, a small loan of a million dollars from his father and then inherited 200 million more. Boy, what a self-made man. But, but the point here is he's a windbag. He brags about himself constantly just because he's him. But in a sense, that's what happens when we say, my country, right or wrong. America, America, we are the greatest, we are the best, we are the last hope of mankind, we are super fantastic, the world would have no hope without us. Really? Are American troops always nobler? Are American leaders always more idealistic? Are American policies always more freedom-oriented and less imperialistic than any other nation in the world? I love my country, but i got bad news for you. The answer to that is no, no, and no. Is the U.S. the last best hope of Earth, as President Lincoln said? Is the U.S. a city on a hill, as Reagan put it? Is the U.S. the light of the world as Christ called us to be, as President George H.W. Bush said? Did Jesus really say America is the light of the world? Boy, I didn't see that in my Bible. Jesus said two things. He said, I am the light of the world, 
And then he said to his followers, his disciples, you are the light of the world. When Jesus said you are the light of the world, he was not talking to American politicians. And so it's very important that we not idolize America any more than any particular politician ought to brag too much about himself. There's great dangers in idolizing your own country. Who is the holy nation? Well, the Bible says you are a chosen people. It's writing to believers here. You are a chosen people, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are a nation within a nation, and we are a nation within all nations. Your first loyalty is to be part of the holy nation that is spread throughout all the nations of the world, not to brag that the red, white, and blue is always right and that this is our first loyalty. We are followers of Jesus first. We are members of the holy nation first. And all of our love for our own particular country and our patriotic feelings must come a very distant second or third or fourth to our loyalty to the living God and to, and to the holiness of His people. The church, and not any country, is God's holy nation. And what we need as a nation is revival of righteousness among the people of God. That's the terrible situation that we have fallen into. If the church within America were really the church, if we were really devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ, alive with the power of the Holy Spirit, and living for Him in growing numbers, a lot of what's wrong with our nation would take care of itself. And we can try and try and try, and we should. I encourage you to get out there and vote Tuesday. Do what you can as a citizen to make your own impact. But at the end of the day, your main impact is still going to be as a follower of Jesus Christ, not as somebody who got your person into office. We need, first of all, a revival of righteousness. And we need to keep in mind that it's the church and not any particular country that is the city on a hill, the light to the nations. And that means then, friends, if we want to make a nation great, we should, even as we go to the polls, even as we do what we can in the political realm, realize that a growth in righteousness, beginning with me, beginning with my family, beginning in my community, that's how the Lord works, not with the one big swoop of dropping the right guy or the right lady into the Oval Office. So we must uh, realize who we are as a holy nation called to be God's salt and light in this world. And then if we want to make America great again, well, we know the answer. What makes a nation great? Righteousness. And so righteousness needs to be pursued if you really do want a nation to be great again. What nation actually is the hope of the world? Well, not any particular country, but the church as God's holy nation. And what is the greatest need of any country? Well, a revival in righteousness, a revival of righteousness in believers' own hearts, in our families, in our congregations. And that may be a sudden thing where God sweeps a nation with revival as the church is again made alive. Right now, one of the main things that's wrong with our nation is the dismal health of its churches. The churches have led the way on many of the disastrous social issues, it was clergy who first started lobbying for abortion before the Supreme Court ever said anything about it. It was clergy who were blessing same-sex marriages before the Supreme Court ever did anything. It is churches that are, that are full of people that are not walking in the ways of Jesus that bring disgrace on the name of Christ and on our nation. I'm not trying to be mean. I, I, I think that's just the way it is. How else do we explain the kind of leaders that self-professing evangelicals are often rallying behind? I mean, a few decades back, if anybody from the other party had pulled those kind of shenanigans, the church would have been screaming. And suddenly, the church is right on board with people who exemplify all the things that our country has fallen into in its wickedness and unrighteousness. 
And so there's, there's really no use pretending. This nation is not going to get great in the next five minutes or even in the next five years. This nation is going to grow in greatness only when God intervenes. And that means that you and I have got to be people who repent and face the facts about the situation in our country at large, face the tough condition in our churches and among professing believers, and realize that righteousness begins with repentance. With repentance and saying, God, we are unrighteous. And with coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and saying, Lord, I want you to credit your righteousness to me because in my own righteousness, I'm lost. All other ground is sinking sand. We need to have that righteousness that God credits to us in Jesus Christ or counts as ours. And then we need the righteousness that he also creates within us by the work of his Holy Spirit as he transforms us. And after, other than that, we're just wasting hot air if we gripe about our political leaders and about the political trends of our country when transformation is not occurring in the individual believers of the country and in the citizens of our nation. So let us pray urgently for God to renew, revive, transform us, and then make us His holy nation. And perhaps in His mercy, He would use His holy nation within this country to make the country itself great again. Dear Father, we do pray that you will have mercy on us, that you will help each of us as individuals where we have contributed to the disgrace and the unrighteousness of our nation to turn from wickedness and sin and to build on the only foundation that there is, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, not to put our trust in princes, even in a season where political passions are high, where um, votes are being cast. We pray that we may do our part as citizens, um, being politically active. Some of us, Lord, um, even in the realm of uh, local government or other levels of government, we pray that you'll help us to do that wisely and well. Uh, watch over Doug and others who are involved um, in the political arena as they um, try to serve their communities. We pray, too, for those who are involved in law enforcement and the military. We pray, Father, that those who are Christians will indeed serve as salt and light in this nation and that you will continue to work among us. Give wisdom, Lord, to voters. Um, we pray, Lord, that you will have mercy on us and give us better leaders than we deserve and that you will um, just raise up the kind of leadership that will serve the people well, but at the same time we pray for transformation among the people. We pray for transformation in the culture. And we pray that your church will be the instrument of that, that they will be indeed be a mighty um, weapon in your hand to bring about transformation in our country. We pray, Father, that, that those who are trying to be righteous apart from Christ and without the help of your Holy Spirit will see the impossibility of that, that they will realize that trying to make a nation more moral without the reality of Christ is, is just not going to happen. And so we, we pray that, that we will look to you ultimately, not put our trust in princes, not put our trust in our own righteousness, but put our trust in you alone, for Jesus' sake. Amen.